Good morning, his church. Here I am again on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers here. I wanted to first give a shout out to my mom watching online, Debbie. Happy Mother's Day. My mother-in-law, Judy. Happy Mother's Day to you and everyone else watching online. Happy Mother's Day. It's a blessed day. You guys may be seated. Now, it was funny, on the way to church this morning, we were driving in, and we literally only live like three minutes from here, and I mentioned to my kids, Chloe and Connor, Mommy's speaking today at church. And they're like, what? Isn't that, doesn't Daddy do that? I said, yeah, yeah, he does. And they said, does that mean we need to pray for you? And I said, yes, it does. It means you need to pray for me. So, of course, being them, they continued to fight over who got to pray first. Um, so we, we figured that out, and uh, Chloe goes, Dear Jesus, please help Mommy today. Please help Mommy today. And help her to have a great Mother's Day. I said, Oh, thank you, Lord. And then here's Connor. Help Mommy to do goodly. I'm like, Help Mommy to do goodly today. So I pray the Lord helps me to do goodly today. In Jesus' name. And I want to give honor to Tom and Diane, our pastor and pastor's wife. Oh, you guys are so amazing. It's so wonderful. We are so, so, so blessed here to have you as our leaders. So thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I, I really believe that God has given me a word this morning, um, actually, that really resonates with me um, that I need to, to be reminded of every day. So... I titled this message, Be at His Feet. Now, I want to start off with just a couple of questions. Bear with me. Think to yourself, do you love throwing dinner parties? Do you look forward to hosting that next big event? Do you have that home where everyone always gathers? Or do you prefer solitude? Are you more of a homebody? Does the mere thought of throwing a dinner party make you want to crawl under your covers and never come out? So, there are two different personality traits here. The first set of questions probably caught some people's attention. Those who love hospitality. Those who love to host, who love people, who thrive off of people. Raise your hand if that's you. How many of those do we have here today? Yeah, that's me. Oh, I guess it's just me and Mike. Oh, Kayla. Kayla, okay, good. Perfect. <laughs> and those of you who just lost your stomach thinking about doing any of that, let's see your hands. Okay, we have several more of those. <laughs> have you ever heard the saying, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Have you ever read their stories and just immediately identified with one or the other? Maybe it's the season of life you're in that you identify with one or th over the other. But a little background on their stories for those of you who are not super familiar with who Mary and Martha are. They were sisters. They were very different. I have a very different sister. We are very different. Love you, Amy. <laughs> These two sisters appear together in the Gospels, hosting Jesus in their home in Bethany and at the tomb of their brother Lazarus. Together, they witnessed probably one of Jesus' greatest miracles, and that was raising Lazarus from the dead. The Bible doesn't necessarily say how they knew Jesus, but they appear to be very well-known and in the inner circle of his disciples. So he had a deep connection with both of them. And one of the famous stories about the sisters is found in Luke 10, verse 38 through 42, and it reads... As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, 
You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, if you ask Mike, my amazing husband, which sister do I tend to model after, he won't hesitate for a second. He knows. So, uh, last Thanksgiving, on Cyber Monday, actually, I came across a deal on this shark robot vacuum on Amazon. Does anybody have a robot vacuum? I know you do. I've seen your vacuum lines. I've seen them. So... I saw this deal on this vacuum and texted Mike before I pulled the trigger on buying it. I'm sure he wasn't nearly as excited as I was, but he supported me. And thanks to Amazon Prime, it was at our doorstep two days later. So I jumped in and I got it set up right away. So the instructions say that you have to give your vacuum a name. And I, I don't think I even hesitated for a second. Martha was now a part of our family. <laughs> she assists me in cleaning my floors on a daily basis at 8.05 a.m., Monday through Sunday. She's never late for work. Sometimes she gets stuck, but I help her out. And she always does a fabulous job. And you think that Mike would be thrilled to come home to nice, clean floors every day. But I may have developed some OCD when she arrived. And so to help her do her best job, I take all six of our dining room chairs, put them up on top of the kitchen table so that she can clean around all the legs. I put our floor plant up on the couch. I put our other plant stand up on our cedar chest just so nothing can get in her way. This is a picture of our dining room with all the chairs up. So he thinks it looks like a closed up diner. He comes home every day to a closed up diner, okay? So, there's our house. There's actually some, some spar stools on the side there, but I wasn't gonna push it. So, I just leave it with the chairs, okay? So, if there are f toys on the floor before we leave in the morning, they're gone before we're out the door. They can't be in her way. Their shoes left out, they're gone. They have to be picked up before we leave. If there's literally anything in her path, and I, I like walk around to see, it's moved before we leave every single day. So, well, if she's gonna be taking care of the floors for me, it would just be awful to have the kitchen counters messy or dishes in the sink, or clutter on the coffee table, dog hair on the couch. This is my morning. I wake up, I start the coffee first. I get myself ready, I get the kids ready for school, and then I make sure all of that is done before we walk out the door. Like I said, I may have developed some OCD when Martha arrived. I love having a clean house. It gives me a little bit of anxiety if it's messy. Now, the Lord blessed us with this home in Savage just a few minutes away, just over a year ago. And both Mike and I clearly heard from God that he gave us this home to be a place to bring people to, for a place for people in need, for, to teach Bible studies, to teach people about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, how can I bring people to this place if it's unkept, right? This is my struggle. I'm a Martha. I love to host. I love hospitalities. I love dinner parties and gatherings. I love people to bring into my kept home that the Lord blessed us with. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that these things are bad. Having a clean home is a good thing. I strongly believe in being good stewards of the things that God has blessed us with. Don't get me wrong there. But it's when these things get in the way of spending time with the Lord that they become a problem. So today, I want to give you four lessons learned 
from the Mary and Martha battle. Lesson number one, our priorities matter. Mary and Martha were very excited about Jesus coming into their home. The passage in Luke names Martha as the one who had actually invited them into their home. And what a blessing it is to be invited into someone's home, right? Feels good. We need to recognize that Mary and Martha are not the hero and the villain. Martha's actions were about being hospitable and serving her guests. Two things that when used right are God-honoring. 1 Peter 4 describes hospitality as a spiritual gift, and Romans 12 describes service as a spiritual gift. So clearly, these are important. So the problem with Martha's actions wasn't that she was doing things that God doesn't value. He does value these things. Martha could have declined to invite them into her home, saying, I'm not prepared for you. I'm not prepared for company. But she was there to offer her hospitality. Unfortunately, that became her main focus when he arrived. Verse 40 states that Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. Mary, on the other hand, she chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Was she concerned with the busyness of hosting? I'm guessing she wasn't. Was she intentionally letting Martha do all the work so she could enjoy all that company to herself? Probably not. She even probably urged Martha to leave those dirty dishes, to leave what she was doing, and join them. Verse 41 states that Mary had chosen what was better. It didn't state what Martha was doing was wrong, but that Mary's choice was of higher priority and more important at that time. Like I said, Martha's not the villain here. She just happened to choose the less important option that day. So if Jesus was in front of you, would your first thought be to make sure that everything's perfect for him? Or would you stop and spend time with him? What is your mind's attention on? I came across this quote that I thought was really good. What we give our minds attention to gets our heart's affection. What we give our minds attention to gets our heart's affection. Mary prized the time with Jesus. She gave her entire focus to his presence. When Martha complains to Jesus... He he gently reminds her of what her focus should be on, and that's building a relationship with him. Yes, Martha did show wonderful hospitality, welcoming Jesus and his disciples, but got lost in all of the other distractions around her. What's stealing your attention from Jesus today? Is it a messy house? Is it your job? Is it Netflix? social media? What's stealing your attention from Jesus? What we give our minds attention to gets our hearts affection. Now I think to myself, (laughs) or remind myself, is it more important to spend that little extra time I have in the mornings cleaning my kitchen and preparing the way for my vacuum? Seriously. Or should I be spending that intimate time with the Lord before the busyness of my day? We need to be able to prioritize our time because it's easy to let our feelings and emotions boss our priorities around. We need to set a time each day to come before the Lord in prayer and reading his word. He is the one who offers the peace that we need. In the middle of all this chaos, 
and all this stuff going on in this world, he's the one who offers us peace. His grace is sufficient, and his mercies are new every single morning. Matthew 6, 33 reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Luke 12, 20, 34, excuse me, reads, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Deuteronomy 6, 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Our priorities matter. He must be our first priority. On to lesson number two. Comparison breeds anxiety and discontent. As we read in the story, we find Mary in the living room. She's sitting with the boys, soaking up everything that she can at Jesus' feet. Martha, she's running around, washing, dish, washing the dishes, checking the roast, setting the table. Everything but sitting at his feet. She's on a mission. Jesus is in her house. The problem is, here's poor Martha trying to serve 15, maybe more people in her home by herself. As she's whipping through the house, she sees Mary just sitting there, looking up at Jesus, taking it all in. And this frustrates her. Her sister isn't helping her. And this is where that discontent begins, when Martha compares her current situation to Mary's. How is this fair? Why does she just get to sit there and be blessed? Well, I have to do everything. Why do I have to go through this trial or this test in life? Why do I have to deal with this illness? When I look at her life and how all of her happy, smiling children that she puts on social media, that family with the HGTV home, so-and-so's perfect marriage, why can't I have that? Comparison is tricky. It never tells the whole story. When we look at someone else's life, we only catch that little snapshot. Truth is, no matter how it looks on the outside or how they want to make it look, God is at work in every story. No two stories are the same. And comparison doesn't change your story, and it doesn't change theirs. But it does steal your joy. Romans 12.2 in the New King James Version states, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It states it like this in the NLT version. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen. Lesson number three, go to the best source first. Even though Martha didn't make the best choice first, I have to give her credit for getting this one right. She knew who to go to. When she gets frustrated by the unfairness of her situation, she wastes no time. She knows exactly who can fix it. Martha marched right up to Jesus the highest authority, and commanded him. She was bold. Make my sister come help me. There is something to be said about knowing who can help. Sometimes we can be tempted to share our problems with everybody else first. Your mom or dad, your best friend, social media. When the wisest thing to do is to approach the one who can actually fix things. 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus didn't rebuke Martha for her words or even her command. He doesn't say, make your sister come help you. You can't speak to me that way. Don't you know who I am? No. He accepts Martha right where she's at and listens to her. He doesn't get offended when you come to him in the middle of your emotional distress. He doesn't mind if you tell him exactly how you're feeling or what you're going through. He adores you. He longs to hear about everything that you face. He is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper, and our light in the darkness. We've all heard that song. He is our best source, and always go to him first. And lesson number four, the path to peace begins with one thing. As it says in verse 41 and 42, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We need to recognize that Martha was doing what was expected of her that day, that Jesus came to her house. Ancient Jewish societies generally didn't treat women very fair. Educational opportunities were limited, with very few women receiving any kind of training at all. As a rule, women in Martha's world were expected to rely on their families, mainly their husbands, to get by. Women were valued for being good wives, for keeping the house, and having children. It's not surprising that Martha's first instinct at his visit was to make sure that the dinner was taken care of. Being the good hostess that she was, the person behind the scenes keeping everything going, these were what people valued Martha for. And Mary just wanted to know Jesus and clearly wasn't afraid to show it. She came, got right in there, sat at his feet. But as I mentioned, their society didn't value education for women. Therefore, that idea of Mary sitting at the feet of a rabbi to hear his teaching, it was actually very shocking, almost blasphemous, it says. Mary, being in the presence of men, was not a cultural norm. The acceptable thing in her society would have been to serve guests and then get the gist of the teaching later from someone else. That's how it worked. Instead, she sat at Jesus' feet to hear the truth directly from him without any hesitation. It says Mary had chosen what was better. It didn't say what Martha chose was wrong but that Mary chose to sit at his feet, to listen and learn from the Lord, and to be in his presence. And this is always the better choice. And Jesus was not going to let that be taken away from her. Even though it was not acceptable behavior for a woman, Jesus actually desired for Mary to sit at his feet. He knew it wasn't acceptable, but he desires for all of us to sit at his feet. No matter what the circumstances are, he didn't care about what was accepted. He cared about how much he loves each and every one of us and wants us to know how truly valuable we are to him. We experience that his grace is sufficient for everything that we face. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 reads, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. We find inner peace and strength to face whatever comes our way. John 14, 27 reads, Peace I leave with you, 
My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These are the kinds of truths that keep us calm even in the busiest seasons of life. Put him first. Sit at his feet. Focus on him, and he will direct your path. Be bold like Mary. Just get in there and do it. And let nothing get in the way of your time spent with Jesus. Our priorities matter. Comparison breeds anxiety and discontent. Go to the best source first. And the path to peace begins with one thing. These are the lessons that we can learn from Mary and Martha. Now, as a busy mom of a five- and six-year-old, a mom that works outside the home, a mom involved in ministry, I've struggled personally to find that time or to make that time. I hear time after time, it's okay. God knows your season. He knows you're busy. You have all these other things going on. You just find other ways to spend time with the Lord. It just looks different now. I get that. And sometimes we can just fall back on that. The Lord knows. I got to keep my house clean. He knows. But when I'm so consumed with putting chairs up on the table, with moving our plants off the floor, with cleaning our kitchen counters before I leave in the morning, instead of spending those precious moments that I do have to glorify my God and to seek him first, that's when it doesn't become okay. I need to be taking that time to be with Jesus. All that extra stuff doesn't really matter at that moment. I'm not a super mom. <laughs> I'm not a mom who has everything all together. I'm just a mom who is trying to keep everyone happy, just like everyone else here. We want to do the right thing. We want to be pleasing to Jesus. I know myself well enough that I, if I don't spend that time in the morning, that, that first, those first moments to start off my day, it typically doesn't go as planned. <laughs> and second, I'm wiped out by the end of the day. We need to give Jesus our best. The morning is my best. I can't give him my leftovers. And now that may look different for some people. There are people who are not morning people, or probably a lot of people who aren't morning people. But if your best is in the evening, give that to him. Give him your best, not your leftovers. I'm usually exhausted by the time I get home from working and dinner and kids, and I don't always have a whole lot left. I can fall asleep pretty easily, if you know me. So I'm aware that my best time with him is first thing. Jesus does understand my season. I do talk to him in the car on the way to work. I say quick prayers as they enter my mind. I do try to be in tune with opportunities of reaching people throughout my day. I really, I really do. And that's what I can do in this busy season of life. But we need to understand that if we don't take that time to spend with him, that undivided attention to give to him, even just to sit at his feet and listen, he will join you right where you're at. If we don't take that time, we're missing our opportunity to know him. If you don't make an effort to spend time with someone, you won't form a relationship with them. 
you won't get to know them. It just doesn't work that way. Same goes for God. He's been pursuing you from day one. He's been yearning for your attention from day one. He's been yearning, yearning for your love, your time with him. Martha was worried about a lot of things, and Jesus didn't deny this. In the same way, I know both you and I have a lot on our plate. Jesus explains that out of everything on our to-do lists, there really only is one thing of utmost importance, and that is him. Our to-do lists aren't here to control us, to cause us stress and anxiety about all the things that we need to do. They're here to help us stay on track, to prioritize our responsibilities, and to make sure to spend that time at his feet. Now that Chloe is in kindergarten, our eyes have really been opened to a lot of things that we never thought she'd have to face at this age. She's been introduced to some behaviors that she's learned from other students that it breaks my heart to see. She's learned words and even repeated words to me saying, Mom, I heard this word. What does it mean? And I have to explain to her, these are words that we don't use because it makes Jesus sad. This is the world that we're living in. It's going downhill fast. And now this fall, Connor is going to be entering the same battlefield. Sometimes I ask myself, why do my children have to grow up in a world like this? Why do they have to be exposed to all these things at such a young age? I don't remember having to face these battles when I was that age. But the Lord reminds me that he specifically created them for this place, for this time, right now. They are the light that this world needs. They need a mom who fiercely prays for them, for their strength, for their faith in God. And they need to see this in action. They don't need, nor do they care, about having a perfectly kept house. They need prayer. Now, I was uh, challenged this last round of prayer and fasting as a church body uh, right before Easter that I was going to wake up every morning before uh, I go to work and that I was going to forget and not worry about all the things that I normally worry about in the mornings, like I told you. And I was going to give that time to God. And Chloe had been displaying some less than desirable attitudes, we'll put it, um, struggling with fitting in at school, and between Mike and I, just in that one week of prayer and fasting, noticed a considerable change in her. We just looked at each other and said, God is honoring these prayers right before our eyes. One week of spending just a few minutes in the morning he was honoring our decision to make our priorities right. Our, our decision to put him first and to trust him with our needs. And he will do the same for you. Make that commitment. <laughs> Troubles and trials, they're always going to continue. Don't be caught up with these things that don't matter. Be caught up with the things that do. Sit at his feet. Listen to him. Follow him. Because when these trials come, and they always will, he's the one who's going to be there. This world is going to let you down. It's going to destroy you. 
but he will never leave you. Mary was willing to break with the tradition to do what was more, most important, to learn from and honor her Savior. Listening to him amongst a group of men, ignoring a, women, a woman's expected duties, Mary is an example of a key lesson we all need to learn and remember. It is not the world's approval we should be chasing. In Martha's eagerness to serve Jesus, she had a heart to serve Jesus. She almost missed her opportunity to know Jesus. And that is most important. Will the musicians please come? Don't miss your opportunity today. If you're here and you don't know who Jesus is, I encourage you to take that step of faith today. He's waiting. He's been waiting with open arms because he already knows everything about you. If you're like Martha and you serve Jesus with everything that you have, you have the greatest of intentions, but realize today that you're serving him but not sitting at his feet. Please do that with me today. If that's where anyone's at this morning, I just want to invite you up to the front, up to this altar. I don't want you to miss your opportunity to know him. You can enjoy his presence that's here right now. He will take all your cares, all your worries. He will take it all away and surround you with an overwhelming peace that this world needs. Lord, help me to learn to cherish and make time to sit at your feet, to be in your presence every day. Surround me with your spirit, your peace, your comfort, your reassurance that you are in control. God, teach me how to discipline my steps and invest my time in a way that pleases you and honors the plan that you have for my life. Lord, I surrender my agenda to you today. I surrender my insecurities, my anxieties. I know that you have a perfect plan for my life. You have a perfect plan for everyone here today. Help us to live out those plans according to your word. Lord, I pray for a heart of hospitality and to have the wisdom of the right priorities. Don't let my feelings and emotions and the pressures of my day get in the way of my time spent with you. Lord, help me to put you first in everything that I do. Help me to be pleasing to you in everything that I do. Help me to be like Martha, to offer my hospitality, but first like Mary, to take every opportunity to sit at your feet. Please bless every mother here today Help us to be aware of these opportunities. Help us to sacrifice other things in our life that are not as important as sitting at your feet. I pray that every mother here and everyone here, that they feel your overwhelming love, this overwhelming peace that you offer. of your life today I encourage you to come up here
here, I would love to pray with you. I would love to see you experience the overwhelming joy and peace that he brings. In Jesus' name, we can't do it without him. We can't do this life without him.